Chapter 14 of The Defiant Agents by Andre Norton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Defiant Agents. Chapter 14. Travis Back was braced against blanketed packs as he steadied a piece of light yellow bark against one bent knee, scowling at the lines drawn on it in faint green. We are here then, and the ship there. His thumb was set on one point of the crude map, forefinger on the other. Buck nodded. That is so. Tsoe, Eskelta, Koekla, they watch the trails. There is the pass, two other ways men can come on foot. But who can watch the air? The Tatars say the Reds dare not bring the copter into the mountains. After they first landed, they lost a flyer in a tricky air current flow up there. They have only one left and won't risk it. If only they aren't reinforced before we can move. There it was again, that constant gnawing fear of time, time shortening into a rope to strangle them all. You think that the knowledge of our ship will bring them into the open? That or information about the towers would be the only things important enough to pull out their experts. They could send a control to Tar Party to explore the ship, sure but that wouldn't give them the technical reports they need. No, I think if they knew a wrecked Western Confederation ship was here, it would bring them, or enough of them to lessen the odds. We have to catch them in the open, otherwise they can hole up forever in that ship fort of theirs. And just how do we let them know our ship is here? Send out another scouting party and let them be trailed back? That's our last resource. Travis continued to frown at the map. Yes, it would be possible to let the Reds sight and trail an Apache party. But there was none in the clan who were expendable. Surely there was some other way of laying the trap with the wrecked ship for bait. Capture one of the Reds, let him escape again, having seen what they wanted him to see. Again, a time-wasting business. And how long would they have to wait, and what risk would they take to pick up a Red prisoner? If the Tatars were dependable, Buck was thinking aloud, but that if was far too big. They could not trust the Tatars, no matter how much the Mongols wanted to aid in pulling down the Reds, as long as they could be controlled by the caller, they were useless. Or were they? Thought of something? Buck must have caught Travis' change of expression. Suppose a Tatar saw our ship and then was picked up by a red hunting patrol, and they got the information out of him. Do you think any outlaw would volunteer to let himself be picked up again? And if he did, wouldn't the reds also be able to learn that he had been set up for the trap? An escaped prisoner? Travis suggested. Now Buck was plainly considering the possibilities of such a scheme, and Travis' own spirits rose a little. The idea was full of holes, but it could be worked out. Suppose they capture, say, Menlik, bring him here as a prisoner, let him think they were about to kill him because of that attack back in the foothills. Then let him escape, pursue him northward to a point where he could be driven into the hands of the Reds. Very chancy, but it just might work. Travis was favoring a gamble now, since his desperate one with the duel had paid off. The risk he had accepted then had cost him two deep wounds, one of which might have been serious if Jill Lee's project-sponsored medical training had not been to hand. But it had also made Travis one of the clan again, with his people willing to listen to his warning concerning the Tower Treasury. The girl! The Tatar girl! At first Travis did not understand Buck's ejaculation. We get the girl, the other elaborated. Let her escape, then hunt her to where they'll pick her up. Might even imprison her in the ship to begin with. Cadessa? Though something within him rebelled at that selection for the leading role in their drama, Travis could see the advantage of Buck's choice. Woman-stealing was an ancient pastime among primitive cultures. The Tatars themselves had found wives that way in the past, just as the Apache raiders of old had taken captive women into their wikiups. Yes, for raiders to steal a woman would be a natural act, 
accepted as such by the Reds. For the same woman to endeavor to escape and be hunted by her captors also was reasonable. And for such a woman, cut off from her outlaw kin, to eventually head back toward the Red Settlement as the only hope of evading her enemies, logical all the way. She would have to be well frightened, Travis observed with reluctance. That can be done for us. Travis glanced at Buck with sharp annoyance. He would not allow certain games out of their common past to be played with Cadessa. But Buck had something very different from old-time brutality in mind. Three days ago, while you were still flat on your back, Declay and I went back to the ship. Declay? You beat him openly, so he must restore his honor in his own sight. And the Council has forbidden another duel or challenge, Buck replied. Therefore, he will continue to push for recognition in another way. And now that he has heard your story and knows we must face the Reds, not run from them, he is eager to take the war trail. Too eager. So we return to the ship to make another search for weapons. There were none there before, except those we had. Nor now, either. But we discovered something else. Buck paused, and Travis was shaken out of his absorption with the problem at hand by a note in the other's voice. It was as if Buck had come upon something he could not summon the right words to describe. First, Buck continued, there was this dead thing there, near where we found Dr. Ruthven. It was something like a man, but all silvery hair. The ape things, the ape things from the other worlds. What else did you see? Travis had dropped the map. His side gave him a painful twinge as he caught at Buck's sleeve. The bald space rovers. Did they still exist here somewhere? Had they come to explore the ship built on the pattern of their own, but manned by the Terrans? Nothing except tracks, a lot of them, in every open cabin and hole. I think there must have been a sizable pack of the things. What killed the dead one? Buck wet his lips. I think... fear. His voice dropped a little, almost apologetically, and Travis stared. The ship is changed. Inside, there is something wrong. When you walk the corridors, your skin crawls. You think there is something behind you. You hear things, see things from the corners of your eyes. When you turn, there is nothing, nothing at all. And the higher you climb into the ship, the worse it is. I tell you, Travis, never have I felt anything like it before. It was a ship of many dead, Travis reminded him. Had the age-old Apache fear of the dead been activated by the Redax into an acute phobia to strike down such a level-headed man as Buck? No, at first that too was my thought. Then I discovered that it was worst, not near that chamber where we lay our dead, but higher, in the Redax cabin. I think perhaps the machine is still running, but running in a wrong way so that it does not awaken old memories of our ancestors now, but brings into being all the fears which have ever haunted us through the dark of the ages. I tell you, Travis, when I came out of that place, Declay was leading me by the hand as if I were a child, and he was shivering as a man who will never be warm again. There is an evil there beyond our understanding. I think that this Tatar girl— were she only to stay there a very short time, would be well frightened, so frightened that any trained scientist examining her later would know there was a mystery to be explored. The ape things, could they have tried to run the redax? Travis wondered. To associate machines with the creatures was outwardly pure folly, but they had been discovered on two of the planets of the old civilization and Ash had thought that they might represent the degenerate remnants of a once intelligent species. That is possible. If so, they raised a storm which drove them out and killed one of them. The ship is a haunted place now. But for us to use the girl... Travis had seen the logic in Buck's first suggestion, but now he differed. 
if the atmosphere of the ship was as terrifying as Buck said, to imprison Cadessa there, even temporarily, was still wrong. She need not remain long. Suppose we should do this. We shall enter with her and then allow the disturbance we would feel to overcome us. We could run, leave her alone. When she left the ship, we could then take up the chase, shepherding her back to the country she knows. Within the ship we would be with her and could see she did not remain too long. Travis could see a good prospect in that plan. There was one thing he would insist on. If Cadessa was to be in that ship, he himself would be one of the captors. He said as much, and Buck accepted his determination as final. They dispatched a scouting party to infiltrate the territory to the north, to watch and wait their chance of capture. Travis strove to regain his feet, to be ready to move when the moment came. Five days later he was able to reach the ridge beyond which lay the wrecked ship. With him were Jill Lee, Lupi, and Manolito. They satisfied themselves that the globe had had no visitors since Buck and Declay. There was no sign that the ape-things had returned. From here, Travis said, the ship doesn't look too bad, almost as if it might be able to take off again. It might lift, Jill Lee gestured to the mountaintop behind the curve of the globe, about that far. The tubes on this side are intact. What would happen were the Reds to get inside and try to fly again? Manolito wondered aloud. Travis was struck by a sudden idea, one perhaps just as wild as the other inspirations he had had since landing on Topaz, but one to be studied and explored, not dismissed without consideration. Suppose enough power remained to lift the ship partially and then blow it up, with the red technicians on board at the time. But he was no engineer, he had no idea whether any part of the globe might or might not work again. They are not fools, a close look would tell them it is a wreck, Jill Lee countered. Travis walked on. Not too far ahead a yellow-brown shape moved out of the brush stood stiff-legged in his path, faced the ship and growling in a harsh rumble of sound. Whatever moved or operated in that wreck was picked up by the acute sense of the coyote, even at this distance. On! Travis edged around the snarling animal. With one halting step and then another it followed him. There was a sharp warning yelp from the brush and a second coyote had appeared. Nagan Ulta followed Travis, but Nalik Ideyu refused to approach the grounded globe. Travis surveyed the ship closely, trying to remember the layout of its interior. To turn the whole sphere into a trap, was it possible? How had Ash said the redax worked? Something about high-frequency waves stimulating certain brain and nerve centers. What if one were shielded from those rays? That tear in the side. He himself must have climbed through that night they crashed. And the break was not too far from the space lock. Near the lock was a storage compartment, and if it had not been jammed or its contents crushed, they might have something. He beckoned to Jill Lee. Give me a hand, up there. Why? I want to see if the spacesuits are intact. Jill Lee regarded Travis with open bewilderment but Manolito pushed forward. We do not need those suits to walk here, Travis. This air we can breathe. Not for the air, and not in the open. Travis advanced at a deliberate pace. Those suits may be insulated in more ways than one. Against a mixed-up redax broadcast, you mean? Jill Lee exclaimed. Yes, but you stay here, younger brother. This is a risky climb, and you are not yet strong. Travis was forced to accede to that, waiting as Manolito and Lupi climbed up to the tear and entered. At least Buck and Declay's experience had forewarned them, and they would be prepared for the weird ghosts haunting the interior. But when they returned, pulling between them the limp spacesuit, both men were pale, the shiny sheen of sweat on their foreheads, their hands shaking. Lupi sat down on the ground before Travis. Evil spirits, 
he said, giving to this modern phenomenon the old name. Truly, ghosts and witches walk in there. Manolito had spread the suit on the ground and was examining it with a care which spoke of familiarity. This is unharmed, he reported, ready to wear. The suits were all tailored for size, Travis knew, and this fitted a slender, medium-sized man. It would fit him, Travis Fox. But Manolito was already unbuckling the fastenings with practiced ease. I shall try it out, he announced, and Travis, seeing the awkward climb to the entrance of the ship, had to agree that the first test should be carried out by someone more agile at the moment. Sealed into the suit, with the bubble helmet locked in place, the Apache climbed back into the globe. The only form of communication with him was the rope he had tied about him, and if he went above the first level, he would have to leave that behind. In the first few moments they saw no twitch of alarm running along the rope. After counting fifty slowly, Travis gave it a tentative jerk, to find it firmly fastened within. So Manolito had tied it there and was climbing to the control cabin. They continued to wait with what patience they could muster. Nagan Ulta, pacing up and down a good distance from the ship, whined at intervals. The warning echoed each time by his mate upslope. I don't like it, Travis broke off when the helmeted figure appeared again at the break. Moving slowly in his cumbersome clothing, Manolito reached the ground fumbled with the catch of his head covering, and then stood, taking deep, lung-filling gulps of air. "'Well?' Travis demanded. "'I see no ghosts,' Manolito said, grinning. "'This is ghost-proof.' He slapped his gloved hand against the covering over his chest. "'There is also this. From what I know of the ships, some of the relays still work. I think this could be made into a trap.' we could entice the Reds in, and then—his hand moved in a quick upward flip. "'But we don't know anything about the engines,' Travis replied. "'No? Listen, you, Fox, are not the only one to remember useful knowledge.' Manolito had lost his cheerful grin. "'Do you think we are just the savages those big brains back at the project wished us to be? They have played a trick on us with their redax so we can play a few tricks, too. Me? I went to MIT. Or is that one of the things you no longer remember, Fox?" Travis swallowed hastily. He really had forgotten that fact until this very minute. From the beginning the Apache team had been carefully selected and screened, not only for survival potential, which was their basic value to the project, but also for certain individual skills. Just as Travis' grounding in archaeology had been one advantage, so had Manolito's technical training made a valuable, though different, contribution. If at first the redax, used without warning, had smothered that training, perhaps the effects were now fading. "'You can do something, then?' he asked eagerly. "'I can try. There is a chance to booby-trap the control cabin, at least, and that is where they would poke and pry.' Working in this suit will be tough. How about my trying to smash up the redax first? Not until after we use it on our captive, Jill Lee decided. Then there will be some time before the Reds come. You talk as if they will come, cut in Loopy. How can you be sure? We can't, Travis agreed. But we can count on this much, judging from the past. Once they know that there is a wrecked ship here, they will be forced to explore it. They cannot afford an enemy settlement on this side of the mountains. That would be, according to their way of thinking, an eternal threat." Jill Lee nodded. That is true. This is a complicated plan, yes, and one in which many things may go wrong. But it is also one which covers all the loopholes we know of. With Lupi's aid, Manolito crawled out of the suit. As he leaned it carefully against a supporting rock, he said, "'I have been thinking about this treasure-house in the towers. Suppose we could find new weapons there.' Travis hesitated. 
he still shrank from the thought of opening the secret places behind those glowing walls, to loose a new peril. If we took weapons from there and lost the fight— He advanced his first objection and was glad to see the expression of comprehension on Jill Lee's face. It would be putting the weapons straight into red hands, the other agreed. We may have to chance it before we're through, Manolito warned. Suppose we do get some of their technicians into this trap. That isn't going to open up their main defense for us. We may need a bigger nutcracker than we've ever seen. With a return of that queasy feeling he had known in the tower, Travis knew Manolito was speaking sense. They might have to open Pandora's box before the end of this campaign. End of chapter 14